All right. Well, welcome. We are glad that you're here. I know it's warm, but uh, it's worse over in the other part. It's 80 over there. But uh, I'm just happy that we got some warm weather finally. Like, wasn't it last weekend that it was still cold and the weekend before that, or was that two weeks ago? Whenever it was, it seemed like it was never going to get warm. So I'm super glad for it warming up. Today we're going to look at uh, our identity as ambassadors. So we've looked at our identity as or in, and so we started with in grace. And so we looked at what does our identity look like in grace? And we talked about Jesus doing the work of the cross. Then the next week we looked at our identity in good works. And it was just saying that because of grace and because of our salvation, that leads us to do good works. And then we looked at our identity in Christ, and we could have spent a lot of time in there, but we spent a week, and it was just, it's actually right before the scripture that we're talking about today. And then last week, we looked at our identity in heaven. And so as Christians, we are seated in the heavenlies. We have already, our citizenship is there. So if you're a believer in Christ, you already have your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you are a citizen of heaven, which then leads us to our identity as ambassadors, because ambassadors are more than messengers. If I get open here, ambassadors are more than messengers. They represent another and they speak with authority equal to that of the person who sent them. So imagine God has sent you, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer in Christ, you are an ambassador. You're more than just a messenger. You're there on behalf of God. God has sent you to do the work of the gospel, to do the ministry that he calls us to do. And so we're going to break that down a little bit. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 21. And we're going to look at a few things that go with this. So we're going to look at the how are we ambassadors, and then we're going to look at what do we do with it. So let's get to the scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. The Bible says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the work, the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. I thank you for this time that we can get together and to dig in your word and to better understand our role as ambassadors. I pray that you would speak through me, allow me to be your vessel, to be uh, your ambassador, Lord, to plead and to even get to a place of begging with some, Lord, to just get the gospel message out. We pray that each one of us would walk away encouraged and that we would be ready to face those that we need to and to encourage them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the first thing that we're going to look at here is God reconciled us to himself through Jesus. So the word reconcile or reconciliation means to change thoroughly. So to change thoroughly, to establish peace between enemies. All right, and you think, well, how was I an enemy? Well, when uh, in some conversations as of late, we've had some, I've had some people say, well, I wish God would have just made it simple to where everything was just perfect and I didn't have to choose. That I just, you know, I just went through life and I had no problems. There was never an issue with me sinning or even desiring to sin. And I said, well, you know, really, he did make man that way with only one exception. He just said, hey, look, you're living in a perfect environment. I've provided everything that you need. I'm going to walk with you and talk with you. I'm going to be here and have fellowship with you. All I ask is that you don't eat of this one fruit. I mean, this one thing. You stay away from that and all this perfectness is going to stay in place. But we know the rest of the story and it happens really early that Satan comes along and he persuades them and he's the most cunning of all create creations. And so he tempts them. Eve falls. She brings the husband in. He falls. And from that point on, 
we have become enemies of God. And here's what that breaks down to look like. God is holy and all righteous, and with sin, we are not. And sin is enemy of holiness. And so if, if God just left it at that, then we have no room in heaven. There's, there's no place for us. He set up the law to prove that we couldn't get, reconcile ourselves. Yeah, although there was temporary sacrifices and things that took place that, that appeased him for the moment, but it had to be repeated because it was never good enough until he sent the perfect lamb, the sacrifice that was good enough to satisfy and to reconcile us with him. And so God reconciled us to himself through Jesus. Now, this is what blows my mind. If you had an enemy and he became your enemy because of something that he did, would you go out of your way to suffer and to hurt and to, to add this enormous payment to get that taken care of, to bring them back to the fold, it's, it would be kind of hard. You know, if somebody did you wrong, would you be the one that went out of the way to say, hey, I'm going to make this right so that we can get back on track? Well, that's what God does. He says, hey, look, man has failed in his sin. And because he sinned, he became an enemy of God because God is all holy. But I want you, I want fellowship with you. I love you. I created to have fellowship with you. And because of that, and because of your failure, I'm going to make a way for you to get back right with me so that we can restore this fellowship and this relationship that we have. And that's what it looks like to be reconciled. So look at this. He, he says reconciled or some form of it five times in just these short verses. So it was very important for Paul to get the word out to be reconciled, reconciliation, to, to change thoroughly. So what did, what did Christ do or what did God do? He sent Christ so that I could be completely changed from a sinful man to a man who is righteous because of what Jesus did. And so right before this, we were talking about, this is, was where we were looking at our identity in Christ. And it says that when we accept Christ, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's in verse 17 of the same chapter. And so what he's saying is, when you accept this reconciliation, then you have become a new creation in Christ. Now, there are some out there that would preach universal salvation. Has anybody ever heard of universal salvation? They believe that when, when God reconciled himself to the world through Jesus, that it was for everybody no matter what. And here's the thing. God did pay for everybody's sin, but it's still up to us to have faith in Christ to redeem ourselves or to be redeemed because of what he did. And so now, in other words, you have to take what he says and say, okay, this is how... This is how I've become an ambassador. This is how I've been reconciled. But then there's more that says through Jesus. And so when you see the through Jesus, it means that you need to know the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And so it's only by him can we be reconciled. And God sent him to make us right with him. And so he made us right. So he did all of the work. So that we and our failure could be reconciled to him. That's amazing. I mean, it's almost like when God tells you to pray for something, you're thinking, now, wait a minute. I'm going to be praying to the one who's telling me to pray for it. It really doesn't kind of make sense, except that God wants us to have fellowship. He wants us to talk to him and he wants us to experience him. And so if he says, pray for this, you pray for it. And then he answers it. You know, without a doubt, there's no doubt in your mind and nobody's talking you out of it, that God spoke to you and that everything that the Bible says is absolutely true. Why? Because I've experienced it. And that's what I've, I've had this conversation with a Muslim before to say, the, the question posed was, well, how do you know that you're, you're, what you believe is true? And I said, because I don't just believe it, I experience it. I experienced God. I experienced answered prayer. I experienced God speaking to me. 
I read his word and it changes who I am. It changes how I think. It changes how I love people and have compassion. All of these things. Why? Because I'm changed thoroughly. God has changed who I once was to become a new creation in Christ because of reconciliation. And so that is how, that's one way of the how we become ambassadors. Let's look at, look at the second way. Jesus puts our sin on his account. So you got to think on banking terms here, right? So imputation says to put on one's account. Look at verse 21. It says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. All right. So again, it's God doing the work, allowing Christ to do the work for who? For himself? No, because he knew no sin. This says Jesus, the one who came to be the perfect lamb of God, knew no sin. He was sinless. All right. He was every bit human as you and I. He had flesh. He had pain. He, had, he bled. He, he was tempted by the devil. He had experiences just like we experience. But it says that he who knew no sin, what did he become? He became sin for us. Why? So that we could be reconciled. So what does that look like? So that we can become righteous in God's eyes. Am I righteous on my own without Jesus? Absolutely not. I'm still a filthy rag. I'm still a sinful, lost person who has nothing. I cannot be righteous in God's eyes because I have even the smallest little bit of sin. I mean, think about it. I'm not big on stealing. I don't. In fact, it's one of those biggest things that I really just don't like. If I know that somebody's thiefing, man, it just it kind of just gets me. But I remember as a little kid at five years old, I remember I had this. Uh, my mom worked with another lady, and the the daughter of the other lady was my age, and she's like. Let's take a piece of that gum. So we were at a grocery store, and she was actually wanting us to steal. It wasn't from, like, the store. It was from the cashier. So we're waiting for our moms, and we so we take a piece of gum. And I remember we're driving down the highway, right? And and all of a sudden, we're just, time, you know, chomping away like this, and, and everything's good. And then all of a sudden, one of the moms thinks, where'd you guys get that gum at? Uh-oh. And I can remember this feeling of... Oh, no, we're busted. And this other person that was with us was like, you know, you're not going to say where we got it. And, I mean, I just laid it down. We got it from the lady back there. And so <laughs> next thing you know, we're going back to fess up to what we did and to apologize and all of that. And so what I'm saying is because of that, I know I'm not righteous. Even that one little bitty thing, you know, you think, well, that's not much. It's not like going to kill somebody, is it? But that made me a thief that day. And so I, I'm classified. If you go to look in the Bible, it says, if you have committed this, then this is what you are. You know, have you ever told a lie? Absolutely everybody's told at least the smallest of lie. I mean, what if somebody came up and said, do I look beautiful? And they really didn't. Are you going to say, no, you look ugly, man? I mean, and I don't know. I mean, there's some borderline of what that looks like in God's eyes. I don't know. <laughs> but what I'm saying is we all know if we're truthful. That that's what we as humans are. We have sin in our life. And even if it's just in our eyes, minor sin, in God's eyes, sin is sin. So imagine this. God with sin is this. If you guys are all sin, and I'm God, and I'm not, don't, don't mistake me, I'm not God. But we're just going to pretend for a moment. If I'm God and you're sin, this is God with sin. He can't look upon it. He wants, it's, it's not a part of him. Okay? And so what Jesus is doing in this, he put our sin on his account. And so God says, if there's sin, somebody has to pay for it. There's a debt that comes from sin. So the, the wages of that sin, according to Romans, is death. So you sin, you deserve death. But are we going to die because of death or because of sin? Well, kind of. We're going to die a physical death because of sin. But that's not the death that I'm, I'm worried about. And that's not the death that I'm warning you about. Because I can't help you in that department unless Jesus comes to get you. We're all going to die. 
But what I can help you with is there's an eternal death that will happen at the great white throne judgment. And what's going to happen in that day is God is going to say, so you have sin in your life. Today is payday. Who's going to pay your debt? And the lost man who doesn't know Jesus is going to say, well, I was a good person. I did all of these good deeds. I did all of this good stuff. I did this and I did that and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and you know what God's going to say? It doesn't matter because there's no scale of, of good and bad. It's not a, man, if I do more good than, than bad, then I'm going to make it into heaven. That's not what the Bible says. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. That's it. That's the only way to heaven. And so in the day of judgment, when I stand before the Lord, or I won't have to go to that judgment, but if I did, I would be able to say, I am righteous, not because of any good works that I've done, not because I didn't sin, but because Jesus paid my debt. And so this says, God made him, Jesus, take all of our debt, every bit of our debt. So every human being that's ever lived, every sin that they've ever committed, Jesus said, I'm going to pay for it, God. So, Father, I've got this. Put it on my account. I'm going to take care of it. Okay? So imagine this. Every sin that's ever been committed, Jesus said, I'm going to pay for it. What's the payment? The wages of sin is death. Jesus goes to the cross to be the ultimate sacrifice to pay for that sin. That's where the whole universal salvation comes in. But Jesus also said, you must believe this to receive this. So even though he paid for all of that, not everybody's going to have salvation. Only those who choose to say, I trust in the Lord. I repent of my sins. I ask for forgiveness of my sins. And I want Jesus to come into my life and be the Lord and my master. And that's what God is saying. I did this for you so that I could have you have salvation. I can have fellowship you starting right now. And so when God looks at us, guess what he sees now? If he's if you're a Christian, he doesn't see you as filthy rags anymore. I remember seeing the, one of the best illustrations that I saw was somebody had a red marker and they wrote sin on a piece of paper and then they gave everybody like a, a red lens that went over your eye over your glasses my glasses over your eyes and and so when you looked at it and so this is Jesus is uh, taking and pay for that you receive these red glasses and so God sees this as just red blood he doesn't see your sin because the blood of Christ covers your sin in other words it pays your debt he took care of you so you don't have to die because he's already done. It. All right. So this is how we become ambassadors. It's Jesus. So God did all the work by sending Christ. Christ does all the work as a human by being the ultimate sacrifice. It's up to us to trust him. And then when we do, it, the Bible says that we become ambassadors for Christ. We're here on his behalf. And so it's a privilege which leads us to the last thing, the what? Ambassadors implore the lost to be reconciled. And, you know, I put the lost in here, but truthfully, it's, it's even the believers. So if I see two brothers, if I see people in the church fighting, I should also implore them to be reconciled so that the world doesn't see two brothers fighting. But here's the thing. Look at this verse. The, we'll, we'll start with 20. It says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. In other words, he's done the work. What you need to do is now you are here to represent him. Now, if you can think of this as, so the first part of this of how we become ambassadors, this is also how we become Christians, but that makes us ambassadors. So when we get to that place, it's kind of a, just a good thing, right? And so it's like, man, this is great. I'm just going to set on this, and it's going to be mine. I'm going to keep that fireproof ticket in my back pocket, right? I mean, that's kind of like we can think of it that way, and I think a lot of people do. Like, oh, good. I've under, I understand that Jesus paid my debt. I've received that. 
reconciliation from God, and now I'm just going to live out my life, and all's good. But let, let's look at the first couple verses in chapter 6 here. It says, the Bible says, We then as workers together with him also plead with you to not you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. He's saying this, if you just said on your salvation, you are receiving grace in vain. It's in vain because here's the thing. The, the whole deal is if we were just to get saved, if that was our only mission, the only thing God, our only job here was to get saved, then why wouldn't God just call us out of here? Hey, you're saved. Poof. He's gone. He's on all, all the way right in heaven. Hey, uh, have you heard about the Lord? Yeah, I want to receive him. Poof, he's gone. I mean, but but that's not how it works, is it? I mean, has anybody ever seen anybody just poof, disappear? No. So what is this? So what's this say? Well, implore means this, to beseech or begging. And here's what I like about this. He says this first. He says, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading. So God's God himself is pleading with us to hear that I have made a way for you to be reconciled to me. So I did the work so that you could have fellowship with me. And so God's pleading with us. And no, then it goes on to say, we implore. Can you imagine? Now Paul is saying, I'm begging. I'm begging you to hear. And that, in other words, what that says is, we should be urgently sharing our faith with other people. I mean, if, if Paul can say, I implore you, so I am begging you to hear me on this matter. He's saying, I want you to know that God did the work with Jesus on the cross so that you can be reconciled, so you can be forgiven, so that you can have eternal life, so you can experience him right here and right now and not only have life, but have it more abundantly. Wow. I mean, what a God. We have a God who says, man, you screwed up. And so I, I think of, I always think of like the, we now have the Avengers and stuff that, that portray the, the gods as this hammer, you know, oh man, messed up, let's smash them. You know, let's just, there's no going back, you evil men. And it's just, the, the, that's what the God of, of other gods are. I mean, I guess that's the way you can just lump that into anything but the true God. The one true God is different. And how? Because we have screwed up. And God says, man, they've screwed up, but I love them. And I created them to have fellowship with them. Let's make a way to restore that fellowship. Let's make a way for us to be able to have a common life together. So that we can have a life that's experiencing God, not just after we die, but here and now, and I'm going to tell you something. I lived a lot of years knowing God and I knew Jesus, and but I just never really experienced all of the praying and, and seeing it answered and being prayed for and experiencing the conviction and all of the things that go with truly walking, being a follower of Christ. And so all of those years that I didn't, man, I just wasted them. It's just like, it's one of those regrets in life that you say, wow, what if I would have actually applied myself to get to know God and let him have control of my life? What could he have did with that other decade or two that I wasted? Man, and I think, and I missed out. I didn't, I didn't experience anything that, that I'm think, well, wow, boy, but I wouldn't have got to do this or that. No way. That all, that stuff is, it's no good compared to experiencing God to the fullest. When you've experienced God to the fullest, you understand that he is the one who has given you the right to become sons of God. There is a privilege that should overwhelm you, not like a privilege that says, I'm better than you, but a privilege that says, hey, I have a mission. And my mission is to tell the world about Jesus. My mission is to tell people that they can be reconciled. Because the work's already been done. They just need to accept it and receive it. 
And if they do, they will be reconciled. They will become ambassadors themselves. And so when you put all this together and you look at it and it says, God took a broken man, a man who had failed him. He's not righteous anymore because of sin. And he says, you know what? We're going to do something about this. And this isn't an afterthought. God already knew this from the beginning. And so this was the plan. So God reconciles man to himself through the work of Jesus, his son, which on Father's Day to me is the greatest gift from a father ever is eternal life. So our gift, so I've mentioned Romans 6.23, the wages of that sin was death. The end result is, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Jesus puts our sin, our debt on his account and he pays for it. I am no longer, I don't have to worry about whether or not I'm going to be good enough or I'm going to be this or I'm going to be that. I fully have faith that God took care of it on the cross, that Jesus was enough to satisfy that payment. And my faith in him, as the verses before, says that it makes me found in him. So that when he went to the cross, I went with him. You went with him. He took all of our sin with him. It's paid for. And so what a shame for so many people to not accept this, knowing that the work has already been done. And all it comes down to sometimes is us as ambassadors helping them to understand what that looks like. People confuse or complicate the gospel. The gospel is super simple. It's this. Man was broken. God made a way to fix it through Jesus on the cross. All we have to do is accept it, give our lives to him, repent of our sins. And I believe there's a there's a, a need to understand repentance, to turn away from our sin, and work, walk in a different direction with Jesus as the new boss man. Hey, I want God to be, I want the Lord to be the Lord. I want Jesus to be my Lord. I want him to guide me. And here's the thing. Once you do that, once I did that, what happened was I began to think, how in the world did I ever do it without him being in control? I don't want to be driving this thing. I want him to take control. And when you do, it's an adventure. And it's exciting. And it truly is living life to the fullest. And then what the, the mission is, is as ambassadors to go implore others to do the same. And that's what we're here, man. I, I encourage each one of you just to really grasp what it looks like to be an ambassador. I mean, we all kind of know what an ambassador is from foreign countries to, like if we sent an ambassador to Russia, there's actually a little piece of ground or a building that they would say, this is U.S. soil because the ambassador is there. And the ambassador is there to represent who? The president. And so he's there to speak on behalf of our country. And so if you can think of it on terms like that, we are a little piece of heaven because we're seated in the heavenly when our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We get to be here to represent that heaven. Although I haven't seen it with my eyes, I still understand its glory. I still understand a glorified body waiting for me. I still understand that the Bible has a lot that I don't understand, but it has a lot enough for me to know that what it does say is true. And when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, if he says it, I believe it. And if I believe it, I am reconciled to God. And I have become joint heirs with him and an ambassador to employ others to do the same. I mean, it's awesome. And I hope that you find excitement the way that I find excitement in it. And when you do and you begin to experience it, share it. I mean, share it. Just begin to share with people. And, and the thing is, is a lot of people will allow fear to slow them down. Don't let fear. I mean, the fear is this. If I don't share with this person and they die tonight, they might go to hell for an eternity because I didn't. That's a strong fear. Somebody jumped off the pier yesterday and is in eternity today. 
not the pier, the trestle. And here's the thing. Nobody, I bet you that young man didn't know that yesterday was his last day. The bottom line is this. Nobody knows when their last day is. And so that's why Paul's saying, I'm, you, we need to be begging people. In other words, we need to be urgent about the message. And then what a glorious message it is. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for allowing us to be your ambassadors. Lord, what a privilege it is to represent you, to be able to speak on your behalf based on what your word says. Lord, to be able to speak truth to a lost world that's searching for answers, Lord, and they're not going to find them until they find you. So allow us to be the ambassadors to point them to the truth. I pray that you would soften the hearts of the people that we'll be in contact with. Lord, that you'll allow us to be your voice, your heart, your hands, your feet. I pray that if there's anyone in here tonight that has never accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that that tonight would be the night that they would just give their life to you, that they would understand that God did the work through Jesus on the cross and that it, our part is to believe that, repent of our sins, and to follow him, to ask for forgiveness and to allow him to be our Lord. And if anybody chooses to do that tonight, I just pray that they would speak to me afterwards or come forward as we play this song at the end. Lord, I just pray that each one of us would be mindful to share with our loved ones, especially uh, the people that we work with, the people that we just even rub shoulders with, Lord, to see the urgency for sharing the gospel. And Lord, to live it as ambassadors, we need to represent Christ well. That if we are citizens of heaven here to represent heaven and salvation, then we need to look that way. So I just pray that you would convict us to be who you want us to be, that we would in the strength of the Holy Spirit, allow you to live out your, our lives with you in control, sharing the gospel with the people around us. Lord, we give you praise. We give you glory. And we just thank you for Jesus and the work that he did on the cross for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. If you'd like to give this ministry, you can now go online. Download Generosity by Lifeway. Search for Fresh Start Fellowship of Oscoda. If you'd like to give snail mail, send your gifts, tithes, offerings, whatever the Lord leads you to give to Fresh Start Fellowship, 41714 Street, Oscoda, Michigan. And remember, Jesus loves you, and so do I.